It's a real pleasure for me to uh, call uh, Victoria Colizza. Victoria is a senior researcher at INSERM, uh, where she uh, is head of a group of uh, modeling infectious disease uh, for many years now. And she will uh, present uh, the impact of self-testing and vaccination of children on school closing. Victoria. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, the organizers for uh, uh, for this conference, uh, for this invitation, uh, it is a real privilege and also a great pleasure to be physically in presence presenting uh, in front of a, of a physical audience and then, of course, in front of an online audience. Um, school closure has been um, an important measure used by several countries in order to, uh, uh, to, to counteract and to curb the pandemic spread. And here I'm showing the data from UNESCO about Europe. And you can see that uh, there, there, there was a large variety in the use of, of this measure. If uh, within Europe only, you can see that there are countries that close school from, uh, for 10 weeks, uh, up to countries that close schools for 40 weeks, uh, school closures could be partial or full. And this was in the time period from uh, March 2020 to March 2021. And if at the beginning the, the information and also our understanding of, of the role of school closure was quite limited in, in the spread, and then additional data coming uh, throughout the different countries, having different school calendars across the year, allowed us to have a better understanding of this, uh, showing that indeed the school closure has a, a, a slowing down effect in reducing uh, R in the community. Uh, and at the same time, uh, when schools are reopened, uh, there is an effect that this uh, reopening is also associated with uh, uh, a likely increase of transmission in the community. So several countries decided then to uh, implement different measures uh, in the community or in specific sectors, for example, closing bars, closing restaurants, closing gyms, in order to preserve uh, the opening of schools, uh, giving schools open a priority. And we know that this priority is very important because of the, of the two talks that preceded me. Uh, but besides uh, measures in the community, of course, there are also measures that can be implemented within the school in order to make these environments uh, safer. And we were talking about masks, we're talking about physical distancing, uh, ventilation, um, for example, also uh, lectures or breaks uh, differentiated over time and other measures of this type. But overall, uh, the, in addition to these, uh, to these measures, there are also some additional protocols that can be put in place. And this was the object of our study. So looking at different ways of using testing and proactive screening within the schools. The objectives are always to reduce transmission within the school setting, to minimize at the same time closure or days lost per student because of quarantine and because of isolation if the, the, the student was infected. And at the same time, in trying to balance these two objectives while optimizing the resources at hand and optimizing them also in light of the behavioral response that we can get in the schools in terms of adherence, for example, to screening, and also optimize that in terms of the uh, epidemic context uh, uh, experienced. So we started uh, using uh, empirical contact data. Uh, these are data that were collected in a pre-pandemic period uh, using RFID uh, sensors. So these are sensors that are able to capture proximity, face-to-face uh, -face proximity contacts between individuals. I'm showing here an example of a, a representation in terms of a temporal network where nodes here corresponds to students. Uh, each circle corresponds to a specific class. Uh, the node in the middle is the teacher of, uh, of the class. And you can see that there are these links, which are the links actually measured by these uh, sensors uh, that also evolve over time, depending on the activities of individuals, depending on, for example, whether there are breaks, lunch breaks, uh, you will see that, uh, of course, there is a large uh, number of contacts which are dispersed across classes as well. As well. As well. Uh, now, these contacts were collected in a pre-pandemic period. So what we did also is to treat these contacts in order to apply some cohorting as uh, uh, um, protocols are now in place to try to reduce especially contacts uh, across uh, different classes. And we focused on two different uh, uh, data sets. One is a data set on primary school, more than 200 students, 10 classes, five grades, 10 teachers. 
Uh, and another one is a secondary school, and we use data from uh, uh, class preparatoire, which is a specific, uh, uh, let's say, uh, type of uh, um, year of uh, school class after high school in France for preparation to the entry to specific universities. And we used it as a proxy of a high school or secondary school amounting to more than 600 students, uh, divided into 18 classes, nine classes for one year, nine classes for the second year of this specific type of secondary school. And these are differentiated also by the uh, subject. So the specialization that is chosen by the, by the students could be, for example, physics, biology, mathematics, etc. And if you look a little bit about the context that, we're, that we were able to extract from this data, we, we see, for example, that in terms of primary school, uh, this goes back, well, in terms of primary school, um, what we found is that students who were in, com in contact with almost everybody else uh, within the class, in terms of uh, contact with distant people, the, uh, the, the line, the horizontal dash line correspond to the actual size of the school. And so you see that in terms of the, for the primary school, this is very high, while instead in the secondary school, contacts are much more restricted. Also, what we see in terms of contacts only is that uh, the um, this, there is a larger number of uh, distinct contacts uh, established uh, across uh, classes than within the same class. And this points to a diversity of contacts, not necessarily to a higher risk of transmission between classes, because to do that, we also need then to look at the time spent in contact. And this is another information that is coming from the data since they are collected at about 20 second resolution. And so what we found is that if we take into account the actual duration individuals are in contact, that there is a much larger interaction time within the same class than across different classes. And this is the same, uh, uh, very analogous between primary and secondary school. In, we used a transmission model, a, a quite simple transmission model that nonetheless is able to capture the, the disease progression in terms of infection, lat, um, um, exposed period, the latency period followed by a prodromic phase during which individuals are already able to transmit the disease and then split into a clinical and subclinical phase uh, and then followed by immunity. All the, the model, of course, is uh, parameterized with uh, um, current estimates uh, for uh, for all of these uh, time frames, and in terms, if we look, if we think about who can possibly be detected and tested because of symptoms, so there is only the clinical uh, compartment uh, on the top of the slide. While instead, all the others can be found exclusively uh, uh, thanks to, for example, a screening that could be reactive or systematic. Then, given that we're looking at two different uh, classes, uh, these impacts different age classes. And so we have a lot of different features that depend on age. Uh, for example, susceptibility, transmissibility, that is what Arnaud uh, presented uh, at the beginning of the session. And this varies depending on age. There is also the rate of clinical symptoms. There are also teachers, of course, in the school. And so we consider also that as a third age class. Uh, there is also a detection probability based on symptom that depends on the age, as we have seen this morning before, that um, it's, um, for example, children has a higher probability of being asymptomatic, but when they are symptomatic, they also have a lower average number of uh, symptoms. And most of the times, these are non-specific symptoms, so they may be harder to identify and uh, um, detect as COVID-like symptoms. And then what is explicitly implemented into the model is the context that of course, change across uh, and depend on age and also depend on role. So whether an individual is a student or a teacher. In terms of protocols, so we considered as a, a baseline reference protocol that is always implemented, uh, symptom-based testing. So identifying a case based on a symptom testing and in case of a positive result, putting the individual into isolation for seven days. And then in addition to that, we tested reactive protocols. So after a case is found, um, the class is put in quarantine, the class of the case, or instead this quarantine can be extended to the 
grade uh, of, of the student uh, that was detected as infected. And this is because uh, looking at the data, we found that there is a higher likelihood of interaction between students uh, that belong to different classes, but of the same grade than different classes of different grades. And this is also because of course they share the same age. So there is a large, a rather large assortativity by age that was found in our data set and confirmed by several additional social science uh, studies. Uh, we also tested as a reactive protocol uh, the screening of the class uh, one day after a case was detected in order to be able to implement this, and also a possibility of confirming it uh, four days after the in, uh, identification of, uh, of the case. And then next to that, which was our main objective, was, a regular, was to evaluate regular screening, that is screening the entire class, the entire school at a given frequency. We'll look at the frequency every once every two weeks, uh, weekly or semi-weekly frequencies. And of course, once we look at tests, we have different options. And in that case, we went forward with the protocols that were uh, implemented or tested as, a, as in, in pilot uh, surveillance programs in schools that used saliva samples uh, uh, in primary schools. Uh, so with a, a PCR uh, result available after uh, on average one day, and instead with nasal self-swabbing in uh, secondary school with a much shorter, of course, delay. This is almost uh, virtually immediate. Uh, we looked at different sensitivities and then extended and tested sensitivity uh, across a large range. And also we looked at adherence to so the possibility, the percentage of participating population. In terms of context, we wanted to put ourselves in a situation of a possible rebound, epidemic rebound in the fall winter 2021. Uh, so in the upcoming months. And so we looked at uh, already uh, a population that was naturally immunized by infection, uh, vaccination in teachers from 50% to the totality of uh, teachers, and then also adolescents. We explored a different range of vaccination coverage in teenagers, while of course instead for younger children, this is not yet possible. Uh, in terms of effective reproductive number, we uh, chose as a basic, uh, this is our, the results I'm going to show you, correspond to a, an effective reproductive number R equal to 1.3. And this accounts already uh, the preventive measures put in place like masks, uh, like ventilation, which are uh, otherwise not explicitly mentioned in, uh, explicitly integrated in, in the model. Uh, we focus exclusively on transmission within the school. And so in order to have, uh, um, to, to account for the level of incidence in the community, we consider different introduction uh, that may bring then the infection from the outside the school to inside the school. And this is done again, uh, looking at parameters which were estimated from community prevalence uh, at the beginning of the year, January, February in France uh, in 2021, and then explore in order to, to, to test the different situation of higher community incidence. Uh, overall, we look at a school trimester, so we let the simulation evolve over a period of 90 days. One of the parameters that is extremely important, so previous studies have looked at frequency, delay of uh, result, uh, sensitivity of test, uh, but an, an additional parameter that comes uh, into place and becomes uh, highly critical is also uh, what is the, the, the percentage of people participating to screening. Screening is not compulsory, and during in the third wave, there was a, a pilot uh, surveillance uh, uh, program uh, um, performed in the region of Lyon where a number of schools voluntarily participated to screening. Um, so screening was offered to, to, to the entire school, but only then a certain number of people participated. And if we look at the different types of schools, we found that in primary schools or pre-primary schools, we're around an average participation of 50% of individuals. While in study middle and high schools, participation was much, much lower. This was during the spring 2021, so it was prior to vaccination in also in teenagers. And also somehow these 
uh, these results are, are, are probably even a bit optimistic in the sense that this was not a regular screening. The majority of uh, schools were screened only once, one time. They were offered the screening multiple times, but in some cases they did not participate, or in other cases, uh, this was interrupted by uh, school closure that was uh, applied uh, in France during the third way, anticipating the holidays, uh, upcoming Easter holidays for a couple of weeks in order to curb uh, the, uh, the third wave. And so if we look at simulation results, so the first objective that we wanted to achieve was reducing the number of cases. So on the left, I'm showing the results uh, for the primary school, uh, comparing the different protocols and looking at a percentage of case reduction compared to what uh, to, to the uh, case that we would achieve with this reference protocol of uh, symptom-based testing and isolation. And it's clear that the uh, reactive quarantine of the class, uh, it, it, it's able just to very, very little improving uh, the efficacy in terms of case reduction. There is a little bit um, um, larger uh, case reduction if we quarantine the entire grade. And this is because, of course, uh, we can probably uh, capture uh, a, a larger number of infections that may have spread to other classes. However, what is clear from here is that regular screening, if participation is high enough, uh, provides a, a clearly a, a strong advantage in terms of control of transmission within the school. And there are these two factors on one side, adherence that, in, that increases the percentage of reduction and the other one that is instead frequency that once again increases our ability to control the epidemic in epidemic outbreaks in the school settings. And it's also nice to see that there, these two factors can somehow compensate one with each other. So if we are in a situation in which, for example, there is lower adherence, we may want to aim for a larger frequency, while instead, if uh, participation is large enough, for example, three-fourths of the population, then a weekly screening is able to achieve the same results as before. Now, for what concerns secondary school results are qualitatively the same, we observe the same trends. The numbers are different because of the differences in context and epidemiological features of these two school age um, classes. At the same time, if uh, if we look, so if we look, if we translate that in terms of epidemic sizes, we clearly see that there is a reduced likelihood of outbreak and that this, uh, uh, the, uh, the size of a cumulative size over an entire trimester is strongly reduced. And this is particularly important in the case of a secondary school in absence of vaccination that I'm showing on the right, where there is uh, otherwise in absence of uh, systematic screening, there would be large tails in this probability distribution of the sizes. Now, why does the, the reactive quarantine doesn't work that well? Well, the reason is that we're looking at a, at a, a system that is not closed. Uh, it's a dynamical process that is in continuous interaction, of course, with the rest of the community. And so we may have importations. Once we close the class of the detected case, we may have anyway importations coming in other classes. We also may have uh, transmission that have already occurred uh, before the case was detected. And indeed, in the simulations, if we look at the probability that an additional class has active infection when a case, once a case is detected, we see that is about 20 to 30 percent probability that at least one of the class is, uh, has active infection. And that anyway, this probability uh, doesn't uh, decrease sharply uh, over the number of classes. So there is anyway 10, 15, 20 percent probability that a larger number of classes is still infected. Um, the other, this is also responsible for the fact that if we test the reactive screening once we identify a case, and this would be the uh, colors in green reactive screening of the class, um, and then the colors in orange would be reactive screening of the class, 
after confirmation of a case and then three days after, so four days after the case detection. We see that anyway, their performance in terms of reducing transmissions is remains equal to the one that is obtained with the, quarantine, the reactive quarantine of the class. And reason is, once again, we are just um, putting, somehow we are just um, answering the problem in a very uh, time-specific way, in a very localized way, but we're not taking into account that transmission may have already occurred or are incoming through importations and introductions in the school. So the other aspect that is extremely important is also what is the cost of all of these protocols. And we evaluated the cost in terms of number of student days lost. So here on the left in blue, light blue and dark blue are the reactive quarantine of the class or of the class grade. And instead the, num the colors on uh, violet colors correspond to the weekly screening uh, with different and increasing adherence. And what we find is that even just considering the quarantine of the class with the, of the detected case, um, by using, instead of that protocol, by using a systematic screening once per week, we would be able to reduce by 90% the number, average number of student days lost. So this would be a large uh, improvement. And it happens, of course, for two reasons. On one side, um, the quarantine is not a specific enough measure because we're putting in quarantine also uh, students who are likely not being uh, infected. And uh, the other aspect is that uh, through regular screening, not only we identify better cases, but putting them in isolation, we are also able to prevent their onward transmission. And so overall, we have less cases, and that means overall less days spent uh, uh, outside of school. Um, we test these over different epidemic conditions in order to see whether uh, these were stable. Uh, and, and here, if you look, for example, different values of R, the reproductive number up to R equal to two, you still see that the violet curves corresponding to regular screening go up towards uh, on, on a vertical line in this plot, meaning that a, an increasing case reduction is uh, uh, achieved with a very small increase in student days lost. When instead, if we look at the, at the blue uh, symbols, uh, they remain more horizontal and the spread on the right-hand side of the x-axis, uh, showing that uh, even uh, with this quarantine, then and even when the increase in days lost is large, their uh, efficacy in terms of reduction of transmissions uh, stays low. Now, of course, we account for vaccination and we tested the role of vaccination. And we did that because in several different countries, vaccination of teachers before vaccination of, uh, of teenagers was uh, open, um, vac vaccination of teachers was introduced as a measure to increase safety of the schools. And what we found is that instead in our, in the specific situation of the um, contact data that we have at our disposals, vaccination of students, of, of teachers would not have uh, so fully vaccinated teachers would not have, for example, an impact in the performance of these of these protocols. And these under different uh, hypotheses on homogeneous of incidence in the community, whether incidence is homogeneous across um, school age children and adults, or whether, for example, there is a higher likelihood of teachers being infected outside the school and so bringing infection inside. And this is mainly in our situation, mainly because we have a very small number of teachers compared to the number of students. In a realistic situation, this must be acknowledged as a limitation of the study, in a realistic situation, there is also additional adult staff at, at the school that we did not consider because they were not traced in the, in the um, tracing experiment. Now, for what concerns that vaccination of, of teenagers, here we looked at at a range going from zero to 70%. Currently in France, more than 70% of uh, teenagers have received at least one dose. Um, and clearly what we see is that 
all the efficiency of all protocols in reducing the number of cases decreases as vaccination increases. And this is simply due to the uh, uh, protective uh, effect of vaccination alone. So if we look, for example, at the epidemic size, we clearly see that for vaccination from of 50% and above, the epidemic size already in absence of any protocol is reduced thanks to vaccination. So that is a very large protective factor and, and shows that uh, once we cross a certain value of vaccination coverage in teenagers, uh, protocols for such as uh, regular systematic screening would not be needed anymore. But another point of, uh, of caution is that on the left, these results refer to R equals 1.3. And so if in the community instead we have larger incidents or larger R or both of them, then these, uh, let's say, threshold of vaccination coverage in teenagers that we need to achieve so that systematic screening is not anymore uh, that important and probably we can avoid to implement it, of course, changes with R. And I mentioned this variation in vaccination coverage because currently in Europe, there is a large heterogeneity. If you look, for example, at data from mid-September, here I'm showing Showing uh, the comparison of four countries, uh, France, Italy, Spain, and Germany, you would see, for example, in Germany is uh, still uh, very low. And this is also because of uh, um, protocols and recommendation. At the beginning, uh, a couple of countries uh, um, have uh, um, proposed the vaccination to teenagers only who have uh, uh, at risk, who are at higher risk of complications. Uh, in other cases, uh, then uh, countries have uh, revised the recommendation after the arrival of Delta uh, variant and then extended to the full population of uh, 12, uh, 18, 12, 17. And so overall, if we look at data from 27 countries reported by the ECDC, the median coverage currently, well, data up to mid-September, was of 13% uh, percent only. And so you see there is a large variation in Europe in coverage. And so these results in terms of uh, uh, how much systematic screening can help compared to vaccination as a function of vaccination coverage in teenagers is, remains an important question. Um, and then we wanted also a last point, uh, to, uh, let's say the results I showed you uh, I, uh, were based on some now optimistic vaccination efficacies um, estimated at the beginning of the year uh, towards the alpha variant. And we know that these have been have decreased uh, for two reasons, because of Delta circulation of Delta, and also because uh, of the delay that uh, from, from the second dose. Now, for what concerns adolescents, we don't have specific data for them as they, um, in terms of, of course, of, of this delay, uh, because they, they are just being vaccinated. So uh, efficacies are very high, but in case this transmission, this uh, vaccine efficacy against the Delta transmission reduces, uh, this would correspond to the plots of the, the data sets of the square, void square, compared to the other data sets which were shown before. And so indicating that if uh, the, the vaccine is less protective against the infection than we, what we had before, then again, this threshold in uh, um, the, the need for systematic screening in order to reduce the transmissions at school would uh, increase as well. And of course, this needs to be evaluated in terms of uh, protocols, which are very specific, whether, for example, screening is uh, concerns also vaccinated individuals or not. Um, and then what also are the recommendations uh, in terms of isolation once a person is inf found infected. Uh, so overall, to conclude, in, uh, if we, uh, in, in case of an epidemic rebound in the upcoming fall, of course, there will be risk of interruptions in the school, not necessarily because of school closure, but simply given by the fact that we're finding several cases. And so if a protocol like reactive class closure is in place, then schools may find themselves in reactively closing uh, a lot. 
Um, in for what concerns primary school, given that this age class is not yet eligible for vaccination, regular screening remains a key strategy and provides an optimal balance between reducing transmission and also strongly reducing, minimizing uh, the closure. For what concerns secondary school, vaccination is the priority in order to protect uh, that uh, environment. At the same time, currently we have a very largely heterogeneous uh, uh, vaccination coverage in several counties. Countries and so for that situation, if uh, if there is a, a rebound, an increase of virus circulation, that regular screening could be an option as well. Otherwise, reactive screening could be the option, uh, um, the alternative option if coverage is large enough. We found that the adherence is critical. So once this is implemented, of course, it needs to be incentivized. Um, the 10% participation that was recorded in, during the third wave in high schools would definitely not be enough for any advantage in using the screening. It would be actually a waste of resources. Um, and then what these results show is also that um, these protocols need to be adapted to the epidemic context, which means not only vaccination, but also circulating, of course, variants and then incidents and R of the community. So uh, they, they could help uh, and, and definitely support uh, a protocols based on different levels of interventions, depending on these criteria. I would like to thank all the collaborators uh, of this work. I'd like to thank uh, the founders and let me thank in particular Elisabetta Tavolosi and Giulia Bassignana who have been the, 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 the engines of, of this work for several months. And then also let me extend these uh, acknowledgements to the rest of the group uh, who's uh, very happy in this photo that was taken just a couple of days outside here uh, uh, because of uh, their, their privilege as well to be here uh, with you all uh, in presence. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Victoria. So can you comment on the fact that you, when, when you test uh, reactive uh, screening, uh, you don't find that to be very efficient? Can you comment on why do you think this is the case? Yeah, th th this, is, this happens because we, it is a very localized measure uh, in the sense that it focuses on the class only. And it's also very localized in time. So we are looking at transmissions that may have already happened. Uh, we are gonna definitely miss a transmission that uh, are not yet uh, detectable uh, because for example, the case that has detected has transmitted, but we are not able to find them yet. If we test as a confirmation four days after, uh, this mm, provides similar results in the sense that it's still very localized in time. And given that we are in, in we are facing a dynamical process in which uh, uh, importation can come anytime from, from the community, and then also transmission can go beyond the school of the detected case. Uh, even if a lot of courting is put in place, there is still a non-negligible probability that the transmission may occur to other classes. So for all of these reasons, the re any strategy that is meant to be reactive, exclusively reactive and not repeated over time is, uh, uh, has a limited efficacy compared to something that is more systematic. Okay, there's a question in, in the distance, distant audience. Um, so you mentioned that you didn't account for the risk of uh, um, transmission outside the school, so you consider a closed system, but uh, can you comment on the, the, the impact that uh, the protocols could have in uh, preventing uh, contamination of vulnerable people uh, in the household? Do you think that if you, if you do the regular testing, this would also help uh, diminish the risk of in the household? Let's say, based on principles, of course, every reduction of transmission that we're able to do in any setting, schools included, then we expect that this will also have an impact on the community. The, the answer to, to that question, anyway, requires some additional analysis in order to quantify this impact. This impact could be negligible because the number of transmissions that we found that we find are anyway small compared to transmissions that may occur uh, elsewhere, 
or it could be an important one. And it's very hard to respond to that question. We asked ourselves that question several months ago, then, but then uh, putting in place uh, in, into the models is very hard to parameterize the risk of infection in different settings. So at the moment we have a very good understanding of what happens uh, within households, but we don't have a very good estimates of transmission, comparative transmission, for example, in workplaces uh, and the rest of the community. So. Uh, the, from a from a methodological point of view, it's very hard to respond to, to answer that question as well. Thank you, Victoria. Well, um, I have a, a other question. Um, so practically speaking, now uh, in France and in other country, uh, we close a class when there is one case in primary school, so we are not vaccinated. Um, and so with all the consequences in terms, as we said uh, lately, uh, that uh, for the child, but also for the community and the economy. Um, so what, what would be, and it seems that closing a class is not that uh, effective, uh, what would be the recommendation, practical thing we could do quickly, uh, or maybe what would be a proposition <laughs> from you? I don't, I don't think it's going to be quickly, uh, <laughs> but, but the Conseil scientifique and the Le Conseil d'Orientation pour la Stratégie Vaccinale, so the uh, scientific committee and the committee uh, that um, recommending uh, vaccination strategies and uh, uh, advising the government based on these results have been uh, issued, uh, have, have issued recently um, a, a recommendation of using systematic testing in primary school exactly because of this reason. So on one side, in order to better protect the safety of that environment and then on the other side also reducing the number of school days lost i i don't think it's a, it's a quick uh, fix in the sense that um we have to acknowledge of course that is uh, uh, it's it's uh, an impressive amount of work in terms of uh, practical application in terms of logistics um but at the same time this is a measure that in case we have a rebound we we we, my recommendation would be to have it at hand ready uh, for for responding and, and in between while this uh, before the implementation it's could it be it's still you think it's still worth to to close uh, a whole class uh, for one case or maybe uh, we could imagine uh, i mean depending on how uh, the uh, mitigation mitigation measure are uh, followed uh, it could change maybe and because it's it's now uh, the serious issue well, I, I don't think there is really anything that is in the middle, like intermediate and quick uh, fix. Otherwise, we would have probably have adopted it already since uh, since some time. Uh, so I think that really the solution in that area would be the systematic screening and a different um, um, thinking instead applies uh, to to the, the secondary school because of the high coverage in teenagers that we have uh, uh, currently in France. And so in that case, uh, the proposal is more into reactively testing after a case is identified without closing the class. Mm -hmm. And then exactly because the efficiency would be the same, but at the same time, we reduce the number of uh, days lost. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think it's time uh, 